Today's guest is Alex Martinez, CEO and co-founder of Intrinsic Medicine. Alex is a patient, entrepreneur, business advisor, and healthcare industry leader committed to transforming how gut, brain, immune access disorders are diagnosed and treated. Driven to lead positive change from within the healthcare industry, Alex co-founded Intrinsic Medicine, aiming to leverage human milk biology to transform diseases caused by immune and microbiome dysregulation, including Parkinson's disease, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, IBS, IBD, autism spectrum disorder, and other GIBA disorders. In addition to his work with Intrinsic Medicine, Alex is working with emerging women and minority-led healthcare startups. This includes his role as business advisor for Women's Pain Management Solution in Cove Health and serving as a limited partner and advisor for Coyote Ventures, a femtech venture fund focusing on women's health. So today we're getting all into this gut brain immune axis and how human milk biology can help with that. And Alex got here as many people who have uh, passionate professional endeavors do through his own painful story with this. And so he's going to share with us a little bit about that and then what we can learn about the impact of human milk on immune pathologies, on gut issues, on all of these disorders that I just mentioned. So we'll go ahead and get into it. Here is Alex Martinez. Okay. So Alex, the gut brain immune axis. So your company is committed to transforming how these disorder disorders with this axis are uh, diagnosed and treated. So can you tell me more about that? How do, how did we get here and what do people need to understand about the gut brain immune axis and, you know, in terms of, you know, I've, let's say you've got gut issues, you've been to the GI doc, they're like, you know, maybe gave you an antibiotic or said you need to have some sort of surgery or whatever, you know, what is your mission? What do you want people to know about the gut and how it connects to their whole body and get a little bit more informed in this area? Hey, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Tara. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, given the opportunity to really talk about something that's just so near and dear to, to my heart, but I, I think it's important to really frame how I got here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and the journey that led to here. So I've had a pretty interesting um, professional background, um, but it's always really been oriented on the healthcare space. It's, it's really just what I'm passionate about. And so I worked in the pharmaceutical industry since about 2011. Okay. And I was primarily focused on genetic disorders, right? And And so you know, and, and that's where I think the pharmaceutical industry really primarily orients itself. It, it treats mm -hmm. our DNA as if it's deterministic from our health. Yeah. And that, and that makes sense for a tiny, tiny subset of people, right. That have mm -hmm. a single mutation that does lead to some genetic condition, but what about the rest of us? Right it's, we're not determined by our DNA. And that's, that's what's coming out is that we can actually change our health status. Right. And so, you know, while I was there, you know, I, I was, I was working on some important drugs for a very small amount of people. And then I was looking at my own health and I was saying, who's developing a drug for me? I have <laughs> all of these different disorders. I have IBS, I have, you know, atopic dermatitis. What's, what's going on here? And so what I recognized is that sort of the chronic diseases, and let's just, let's change the way we even think about that in this discussion. These are all manifestations of chronic poor health. Yeah. And what is that driven by? It's driven by sort of a common dysregulation of the immune system and dysregulation of the gut microbiome, and also now that we're discovering it, all other biomes, oral microbiomes, skin mm -hmm. microbiomes. Mm -hmm. And so kind of with that, that sort of really, you know, created the thesis for starting my, my company, Intrinsic Medicine. So can you share a little bit more and here you are and you're like, well, I have IBS and I got these skin issues and there's clearly something going on with me. Can you share more of where your story went from there? Because um, I'm, I just want to frame this of 
the reason I'm asking this, I mean, one, it's compelling, but also because when you are dealing with chronic gut issues and you haven't been able to resolve them, it is one of the most frustrating, um, depressing, you know, cause your, your mental health will not be where it could be. Um, and it can be tricky for people. And there's a lot of frustrated people out there who have gone to doctor after doctor, after doctor or health pro, even holistic health pro, and they haven't been able to resolve that. So I think just, you know, you are not alone <laughs> sharing that and, you know, your own personal experience can be healing just in hear that somebody else is going through a similar thing. So would you mind sharing where you went from that realization? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, the first part is actually awareness, right? And you, you probably talk about this, right? When you just have mm -hmm. to become aware. So I've had it so long that, you know, probably since I was like 11 years old, that it becomes just baseline. It becomes yeah. normative. And you're just like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, it's just normal to just be anxious the moment I wake up about my bowel movements, um, never wanting to travel, you know, having to make excuses, to go to the bathroom, you know, dozens of times a day, like mm -hmm. um, being in pain after eating, right? right. And, and, and you just kind of like, you norm to it. And what was, you know, I, I, I think, you know, ultimately a blessing in disguise is, you know, I, I, you know, left my stable job to, you know, start this, this vision I had for, you know, a, you know, a company that can, you know, really provide meaningful solutions for kind of the rest of us, right. For what we're, what we suffer from, what, from the people we love suffer from. And that was when my, my GI health got really, really bad. Like, of and of course, right. So <laughs> I, I wasn't even really thinking about the gut brain connection as much then I was actually thinking about the inflammation the immune system brain mm. then, but I wasn't thinking so much about the gut. And so my journey was, you know, one where eventually I just was unable to eat. Like every time I ate, I was just, you know, in a fetal position. Mm. So I rapidly lost about 40 pounds and, you know, was evaluated for, you know, peptic ulcer, penetrated peptic ulcer. And it was, it was an odd um, journey because then, you know, I get evaluated for that. And then all of a sudden a surgical oncologist actually walked in the door and I'm like, what, what's going on here? What's right. this introduction about? And so they, they'd found a mass connected to my small intestine. And, you know, then we were, you know, going through that sort of frustrating diagnostic journey where they were unable to get a sample of it. They were unable to really find out what's wrong. And it came up to be a, a situation where they said, we have to do a surgery that's going to be diagnostic at the same time. We're going to cut you up and poke around and mm -hmm. see what's in there. And so. And in the back of your mind this whole time, you're like, maybe I have cancer. It, it, right? Yeah, exactly. And then it's like this, egg, <laughs> and it's also, it, it's like this existential thing. You're like, oh yeah. Leading up to it. And you're like, well, what do I do with my life? If it is <laughs> this, like, right. like where right. do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, they went in luckily not cancer. It was actually a, a, a necrotic duplication of my GI. So I actually like where everyone else has a single tube, mine also had a little cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. uh, that it went necrotic. And so it triggered inflammation mm -hmm. and, and so they had to cut out like a little less than two feet of my small intestine. Wow. To, to resolve that because what was happening is I was having a uh, chronic bowel obstruction, which is mm. not, I mean, it, you know, you can, you, you can die pretty easily from that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so the inflammation was that bad. And, and so what we understood is that, you know, after that, you know, came sort of the recognition that, oh, so I had, I, so I have both IBS and then I had this chronic inflammatory process going mm -hmm. on my entire life. And so what was striking about that is, you know, getting a surgery like that, they're like, okay, time to carpet bomb everything. Okay. Antibiotics inside out, right? Like oral, like let's get it all gone. And, you know, after that, they're just like, you're released into the wild and you're told to go on the most Western of Western diets, right? Which I'm sure- yeah right it's there like is, what 
it's like oh eat pancakes you know pancakes and just like a, yeah, a grain grain and sugar based just gluten and sugar wow. gluten and sugar right wow. and it's saying hey like do this for the next six weeks while you take these continue to take these antibiotics Whoa. and you know what's the expectation what's what what baseline am I going to return to after that? And so, you know, that's where, you know, being able to work at the forefront of, 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 of like an area gives you privilege, the privilege of knowledge. Right. So right. I was like, and, and, and the recognition that almost like, this is a standard of care. Like right. I know I need to rebuild my gut microbiome and like mm -hmm. there's literally zero mention in any aftercare. Wow. And so you know, that really, you know, solidified the drive and determination mm -hmm. to say like, okay, and, 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 you know, why, uh, you know, I welcome the opportunities like this to like educate people on this, you know, anytime you take antibiotics, like you need a real focused plan to rebuild your microbiome and like, you need to mm -hmm. figure out like, what are the prebiotics like mm -hmm. that you can use because we'll always have kind of like sort of the remnant colony, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. Like mm -hmm. it, like if you think about your, I like to think about the gut microbiome, like a civilization, right? Right. Right. They're like a civilization. They're like, that. they're like a um, civilization that we're, we, we have a, a very close alliance with mm -hmm. and they just went through the apocalypse. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and hopefully some of them, they went in some bunkers. Right. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Like it's time for us to start airdropping resources back to them so yeah. they can rebuild as expeditiously as possible. So that's yeah, kind exactly. of, uh, um, you know, part of the journey that I went through there. Mm. Um, when you talk about this obstruction, which by the way, it's like, wow, I can, um, I can see why you had a hard time figuring out what was going on, you know? And it does sound beneficial that they did that surgery, you know, often, I, yeah. it, I don't know how else they would have figured that out. But, um, when you say that you had this obstruction for so long, like all I can think of is like SIBO, you know, or SIBO being you guys, a uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and a lot of, um, IBS is SIBO they're finding now. And when you are just, you can't get things through your small intestine into your colon and out, and you have this obstruction for so long, it just creates this breeding ground for bacteria, which we shouldn't have in our small intestine. Right. So I imagine you must've had, you know, some, some form of SIBO pretty badly at yes. that point from not being able to get things through. Right. And so yeah, the Western mindset, I'm not saying there isn't a place for antibiotics. There are, for sure. I think we all agree on that, right? There is a place for them sometimes and um, being used wisely, right, can save your life. Um, but with the the Western mindset, uh, Western medicine mindset currently still is hill mindset. It's just like, it's like the war mindset. It's like very America, you know, it's just like kill, 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 kill. And there is a lack of focus on nurture up, nurture a healthy environment. Let's nurture a healthy environment so there can be balance and function. And, you know, this little civilization can thrive. That is severely lacking. You know, anyone right now, currently at the time of recording, if they get an antibiotic for any reason, which they will get even for Oh, you're going to have dental surgery. Well, just in case, let's put you on a round of antibiotics before and after. And there is no mention at all of here's how you rebuild your gut microbiome. So now we're left with, we got to listen to podcasts like this or go to intrinsic medicine or work with some sort of holistic professional to even, even find this out. Most people still, you know, it's our world. So we think people know I, mo, you go to on the street and you're like, Hey, what should you do after you have an antibiotic? And they'd be like, what? And, you know, they might be like, maybe like, oh, probiotics, but they're like not actually going to do that if they take an antibiotic. That's where most of at least the United States is. Right. So, um, so what did you learn on your journey? You know, here you are, you're like, wow, they're just telling me to eat a diet full of gluten and sugar. Where did you go from there? Yeah. So where I went from there is also kind of, I think, linked to my philosophy, which was, you know, Imagine the drugs we'd have if every CEO was the first person to go on them, right? <laughs> they'd have a very different side effect profile and they'd probably work much better. Mm -hmm. And so that was something, you know, I always kind of want to, you know, live the things I speak. And so, you know, 
I, I had actually had access to uh, our oligosaccharide, their prebiotics, um, mm. to um, sort of food grade variants of them, and I use those to rebuild my own microbiome. Nice. Yeah, and that's that's what I did, and I've you know effectively been able to cure you know my IBS and my atopic dermatitis, and um, and and so it really helped me you know, clarify the need, uh, uh, you know, especially when you're, 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 you had a baseline status that was, you know, diminished. And mm -hmm. then you're able to leapfrog above what you thought was your healthy baseline. That mm -hmm. is, that is just a profound experience. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, the, the other aspect that it really drove to home is, is gut health is the ultimate sort of empowerment opportunity for people, right? That's why like genetic determinism is the opposite. It's like, it's fatalistic. It's like, you're not in control, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, here we're the only ones with the solution It's going to cost you half a million dollars a year. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but with gut health and thinking about yourself as like a super organism, right? If we think about ourselves mm -hmm. as a super organism, right? We're, we're just a bunch of cells that decided like, Hey, we're going to work together and we can have a, a better mm -hmm. experience. And then mm -hmm. they made friends and those friends live inside us and outside us. Mm -hmm. And, and so what we have here is an ecology. And I, I like what you talked about that dominator mentality, right? That's how mm -hmm. germ, that's how germ theory was introduced mm -hmm. and how it's been perpetuated. Like, kill them all, right. let someone else sort them out, right? Verse, and that's called the hygiene hypothesis. And what happens when you categorically are removing these, these organisms and these communities of organisms that co-evolved with us? I mean, I like to remind people that you look at the GI tract, what does it look like? If you extract it from a human body, it's a worm, right? It's mm -hmm. the earliest organism that said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to colonize together, work together. And their first friends were the microbiome. So mm -hmm. the microbiome, the GI tract predates our brain. It allowed us yeah. to evolve into this complex structure. Right. Yeah. So, so when you think about it that way, and you think about, you know, what we're, we're taught, everything needs to be like completely antiseptic. And you look at the corresponding rates of things like autoimmune conditions, mm -hmm. what does it mean? Is it means our body lost the ability to recognize self and not self. And what we're learning is that the these commensal uh, microbiota, they're the teachers of that important yeah of that it's you know they, they train the immune system right 70 percent of your immune cells are in your gut right that's the thin blue line mm -hmm. between yourself and not self and it's the only environment where you're taking the outside environment and bringing it inside you right yeah. so and so that's it's such an important training ground and these gut m microbes they help they actually are outside the wire mm -hmm. um uh with, with a biofilm that provides defense, but they're, they're talking to our immune cells. They're training them. They're educating them. And when you remove that via, you know, antibiotics on the skin, given, you know, you know, what we just went through <laughs> where mm -hmm. people were dousing their skin and, you know, denatured mm -hmm. alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, you know, we have an epidemic of autoimmune mm -hmm. disorders and skin conditions and, and so, so these are, they're, these are really lo low hanging opportunities that, that we all can do. And, and the beauty of, um, bacteria and their life cycle is a few days for us is, you know, millennia for them. Yeah. So, so these changes can be brought about pretty rapidly. I mean, you yeah. mean, right. You, you, you know, this better than probably me, how quickly somebody can change, you know, their microbiome. Yeah. Um, you're, I love the point where you were talking about like, let's drop them in supplies, right? They just went through the apocalypse. Let's drop them in supplies. Um, one of my personal and professional interests is in our soil health, right? And the mm -hmm. soil is just like your gut. It's just like your gut. It's a microorganism 
uh, world universe. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just thought I'd share this on the note of gut health. Cause I think it draws such a wonderful picture and gives a lot of hope. Um, I, I helped put on a regenerative agriculture awareness event in Oklahoma at a, at a, at a ranch in 2021. And they had, um, you know, representatives from the Noble Research Institute, which is the longest and biggest agricultural research institute in the United States. They had representatives from the Savory Institute who are the leaders, creators of the whole regenerative movement there. And one of the things that they taught us that reminds me so much of the gut, I always think of it, is that in the soil, there are these like basically dormant seeds. They've gone dormant and they can stay dormant for a really long time. And once the environment of the soil is made healthy enough again, this is what actually um, classifies a regenerative farm or ranch as being regenerative. They have to have somebody come out and they're looking for these specific plants that show if these ones are growing, that means you have regenerated the soil to get some of these ancient seeds that are no longer growing in most areas. You got them growing on your farm or ranch. So yeah, good job. Right. So they're looking for these specific ones. And I always think about that with the gut, right? Because even when you have, yes, created the apocalypse through, you know, you, you get people with autoimmune issues and they get put on these drips, these IVs of antibiotics for like a month, you know, when they've been taking them so much, like just to give a little hope, a lot of these keystone strains of bacteria will go stay dormant in your gut. And as long as you can create a healthy enough environment, nurture them, you know, and that goes from not only giving them food and supplies, but also calm, you know, increasing the health of the vagus nerve, being in your parasympathetic, sleeping, like all of these things factor into it, but you can make those come alive again. You can feed them. You can create a healthy environment once again, where they will come back. They will grow, you know? So just trying to give hope there. It is just like the soil are the microbiome, right? The microbiology, there are all these little microorganisms and they can be fed and replenished again and revived again. Um, and that's where I kind of wanted to ask you about this. Cause I know that you guys are into the human milk biology for disease states. Can you share a little bit about that and how it impacts the microbiome? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, that's, that's one of like the, the coolest things about what we're doing, right. We're in like it, you know, I think there's a lot of hubris out there, right. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of how we think about technology. And so what we're, what we've done is, you know, I, I found these human milk oligosaccharides and they were sitting in infant nutrition labs. And I looked at them with the lens of, you know, a pharmaceutical developer. And I said, wait, why, why are we thinking about them nutritionally? They're non-nutritional. They're amylase resistant. A human being cannot actually digest them. Right. And so after fat and lactose, which are nutritional, which are caloric, these are the third largest solid component of human milk. They're as high as 15 grams per liter in colostrum. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, what do these things do? Nice. There's hundreds of structures, distinct structures, like there's 200 characterized structures of these. And mm -hmm. I started looking at the data and each one has a completely different biological function. Wow. Um, what's, what's unique, what's uniquely special about these is they are classified as prebiotics, but they also have direct effects independent of the microbiome. So that's also equally fascinating. Wow. And so as I looked at their multifaceted benefits, I'll just run, run, run through that with you. So they do feed like the most beneficial microbiota, the, the bifidobacteria, like the, yes. all the different ones. They're the preferential substrate. They even like, so they're preferential food for them and they even regulate the genes in those bugs. So those, so the bifidobacteria can actually form the biofilm. Hmm. So, so I think about them as like a terraforming. Some of them are like a terraforming agent for, for a baby's gut, right? It's completely naive. It's the wild west and they're adding some order and helping. Uh, can you, yeah. Can you explain what a biofilm is for those who are unfamiliar? Yeah, so so a biofilm is is really part of you know the it, it's basically the you know putting up homes <laughs> you know yeah. it's it, it's it's the way that 
uh, you know, different bacteria would sort of cooperate and, and they would sort of, you know, put down roots. Yeah. And so imagine these, you know, basically these compounds are, are, are being co-seeded with, um, from the mom, because this is the other thing, because, so you have these in the milk, but importantly, and one of the things that happened with C-sections, right, is when a baby comes through the birth canal, they, that's, that's part of how they're colonized by right. their mother's microbiome. And then, you know, then these compounds come in with resources for those mm -hmm. to grow. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was so exciting about human milk biology and, and these human milk oligosaccharides in particular is it's basically a, a communication tool for a mother to communicate with both her baby's developing somatic cells, the baby's own body cells, but then also the microbiome nice. and, and, and to cultivate that. And mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's really fascinating. And, you know, for, for me who wants to develop, you know, new therapeutics, the other thing is that they're so safe. Right. Yeah. And like, and that's, that's what matters most, you know, first do no harm mm -hmm. and, and something that's the result of 250 million years of mammalian evolution mm -hmm. is, is yeah. going to be pretty, pretty safe, but also hopefully extremely effective. Wow. You said there's 200 different types that all have different roles and yeah. found in human milk. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing. And, and there'll be ones that are made of literally the same building blocks, but just a different bond, like the different angle of the okay. bond completely wow. changes the biological activity. Wow. Whether, whether it, 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 it's anti-inflammatory or whether it just feeds a, a you know, a particular bug. And I, I think one of the things that's also important, um, as we talk about the microbiome, because so much focus is on, you know, who, who's a cast of characters, like who are these bugs? Right. Yeah. But, you know, think about any human community. Yes. The people matter, but what matters most is what they're doing. Yeah. And, and so that's what we're figuring out, right? It's, 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 yeah, we want the right people there, but we also need them to be doing the right things. And mm -hmm. that's what compounds like human milk oligosaccharides do is make, you know, they make sure the right people are there. Yeah. And they're doing the right things. They're producing a bunch of short chain fatty acids, right? Yeah. So they're, they're, they're producing all these different met metabolites and also small molecules that are active in the brain. Mm. So wh where do you source? How do you get these? Do uh, uh, breast milk yeah. donation banks or? So it's a great question. That's absolutely. So that's where some of the early research came from. And that would be completely unacceptable to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, like that, that like it would be unacceptable to distort donations and divert them from babies. So <laughs> I of course would not do that. And so luckily these compounds, they've been, they've been evaluated for decades to make infant formula closer to human milk. Mm. And, and that was mainly just focused on the microbiome stuff. It was mm -hmm. before, before, you know, because the uh, bifidobacterium, like people have known about it for a hundred years, it was called the bifidus factor. Mm. And so, so the infant formula company was saying like, Hey, maybe we could add some of these back in instead of the not so great stuff that's, <laughs> that's in that formula. Um, and so synthetic biology manufacturers actually created, you know, recombinant organisms that had like the human gene to produce these. And you literally can put in lactose and glucose and your output is these, you know, amazing molecules. I see. Okay. And, and so we're kind of standing on their shoulders in order to, you know, have, have supply and, um, you know, move it forward in clinical studies. Nice. Okay. Thanks. What are some of the, um, disorders or issue, you know, health issues that you've seen these really help with? So IBS is really the, the big one. There was an open label study, um, where it worked really well. And, and in fact, it worked, it looked like it worked better than, um, you know, the, the market leading drugs that have some pretty significant side effects. 
Um, the, the one thing that they were sort of missing though, was a control arm. And so that's kind of our work is, okay. uh, and, and that's, and that's really kind of the unique opportunity. There's, these have been proven in clinical studies to have amazing benefits on infants, you know, with, with controlled groups, they, they can like lower systemic inflammation, right? IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, IL-6, um, they can improve, you know, colic, diarrhea, you know, you know, GI distress in infants. And there's some emerging data that they, they, they work in adults, but no one's done the diligent, you know, gold standard placebo control studies. And that's literally what my company is about is to really okay. convince the scientific community, right? It's how we change practice. It's the only way mm -hmm. we're going to change practice. Cause mm -hmm. as you said, right. We're the best resource, you know, people coming to your podcast is like the current state of the art for this. So I, I, I say we have to meet everyone else, the providers where they are and totally. give them the, the body of evidence where they say, mm -hmm. I can't ignore this and I need a plan and where they're, where it will be there to help them. It's awesome. Yeah. They're not interested in anecdotal reports, right? So thanks for doing that work. Um, how about like nervous system issues? You know, have you seen any help there? Yeah. And so this is where things are really exciting. Um, cause the, the, one of the cool things about human milk oligosaccharides is, you know, you can also take away the human for some of them. While we have the, the most abundance and diversity of these, guess what? We have a lot of relatives. We have a lot of mammals out there. And so, you know, the, the ones that I'm prioritizing are also common in, in, in mouse milk, right? So we mouse? have, yeah. So even, yeah, even mice have, have some of these, right? And so it's important there is like, okay, so is this, con the biology is probably is conserved and we know it's conserved, uh -huh. right? So, so in, in mouse models of social stress, for example, some of our compounds can completely prevent a change in behavior, prevent the mouse from being stressed out. Huh. And when you look in the brains, you know, a, a mouse that, you know, is not taking anything, it's eating its normal mouse diet. Basically, the the neurons responsible for neuroplasticity are like completely reduced. They drop in half. But you give these compounds, and guess what? They're completely wow. protected. Wow. I, I don't know if anybody else just had the moment of realizing that mice have milk because they're mammals. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little teeny tiny bit. A little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Wow. How about, um, you know, in the people who are chronically inflamed, right? Yeah. There's so many of those people. Have you seen any benefit? Have you worked with those populations? What have you seen there? Yeah. So the, one of our compounds is actually currently in a, in a phase two clinical study in young adults and children with in inflammatory bowel diseases, both okay. Ul okay. ulcerative colitis and Crohn's right. disease. Right. So we're really excited about that one because th there's also um, and, and this actually could be a very interesting thing for, for, um, listeners. If you do have GI issues, see what your FUT2 status is. And okay. that, and so the FUT2 is a, is a gene. F-U-T, guys. F -U -T F -U -T yeah. F yeah. F-U-T2. And like 20% of people don't have it. And it was, it was probably because there, there was an, inf a local infectious disease that used the sugar that that creates to, to enter the body. And so now, however, when we look at people that are missing that, so it means they don't produce it in their milk and they don't produce it um, connected to a protein that lines the gut. And what those people often get is they get inflammatory bowel disease and they have systemic inflammation. And it's because they have a lower bifidobacterium mm. in, in their guts. And so if somebody's been really struggling for a while, that might be another opportunity to, to, to understand it and then just think about, uh, okay, what dietary changes, you know, what prebiotic approaches could I take that could really better nurture, um, you know, that. 
Okay. And then in terms of testing that, because I know if I w- had Crohn's or something or chronic gut issues, I'd be like, okay, how do I find that out? Um, I don't know if you guys have something you recommend, but, and I know people have their personal opinions about running DNA analysis and I totally respect that. Um, but I, if you do something like 23 and me, they will test for that. Like 23 and me and ancestry health, in my opinion, or like they run the big, well, not my opinion for, as from what I know, they run the biggest sequence of DNA. So you know, you have to kind of go into the back end of your analysis. It's not like on the cute, like you might have curly hair, like weird stuff from 23 Me. But if you go to the actual list, they will put that there, you know, what they actually tested and what came up. So that's my recommendation. I don't know if you have something different. Well, I think it's a solid recommendation. That's the thing. Okay. We don't, we don't, we don't have really targeted approaches yet. And yeah. It's one of the things that I, you know, I want to, you know, create yeah. like a, a, a very specific diagnostic for this. Nice. Okay. So, um, in terms of, you know, someone listening, are you guys on the front end of helping people or are you more on the back end research end of things? So we, we are, we are, we're a clinical development company. So that's, you know, the objective here is to not only, you know, provide the data that's going to convince, you know, all the scientists, all the healthcare providers, but it's also to, to bring them to market, right? And and nice. most importantly, it's to bring them to market. And I view biological toxicity um, just as bad as financial toxicity, right? So we want to bring them forward and make sure they're accessible to people. And that's that's kind of the the goal here because there are there are some supplements on HMOs and I, that and likely I'll be launching my own just. To, right. to, to, ha- to handle to handle this, you know, the issue, which is people are like, all right, you sold me. What can I yeah. do to, right. <laughs> to maintain my health? And, you know, and, and I want to do something where, you know, there's the right purity. I think that really matters a lot. Um, but one of the, the biggest issues is at the doses that we think are going to be therapeutic, like disease modifying. I'm getting to run a Parkinson's disease study, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm based on the data we have for one of these on, on both the gut, but also the cognitive aspects mm-hmm. of that disease. But the dose that those people are going to take is going to be really expensive. If you, right. if you try to buy the amounts required for it on a supplement. So that's part of our mission is mm-hmm. to get these reimbursed as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then, you know, with the supplement play, the aspect might be there and say like, you can choose to use this, right. I, I, I you know, I don't want to withhold some somebody who is self-directing their care um, and being proactive about it. But at the end of the day, for me to provide a real solution, you know, I got to remove that out-of-pocket burden that the average mm-hmm. person, uh, w- w- you're right, mm-hmm. would cause stress, right? It would cause stress in their mind, which then right. would lead to stress in their gut. It would go right back to, you know, the gut and exactly. to the, the, the body. So I know I feel for somebody in the, in the gut and, craziness because it's like just the stress about it is like feeding this crazy feedback loop. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but, the, and then you don't really have the mental health bandwidth cause you're inflamed and you're, you know, not, nothing is working correctly. You're reabsorbing toxins in your gut sh- in your bloodstream because you're probably all backed up. And so everything is just not working. And then you're trying to manage all your life stresses with this little bit of bandwidth. And then that creates more gut issue. And it's just like, Oh my gosh, so much love you guys. <laughs> And on that note, I mean, I imagine since you guys are doing the the big deep work that most people aren't willing to do, <laughs> getting the clinical studies, I'm, I'm assuming you guys are open to investors. If there's anyone listening who is in that kind of position, and this is an area that matters to you of basically changing the recommendations of Western medicine for gut health, you know, to obviously they could reach out to you guys probably through your website if anyone's yeah able and you know that's something that interests you and it's intrinsicmedicine.com um yeah and i just have to say thank you um i'm just, i'm i'm like sorry but not sorry for everything you went through i know that probably really sucked for a really long time you know but it when you said that you decided to start to shift and then all your gut issues got worse i'm just like that's how it goes right mm-hmm. like it's just like here you go here is your purpose <laughs> you know <laughs> So yeah. thanks, thanks for showing up and, and yeah, my getting pleasure. solutions, not only for yourself, which is where it always starts, right? Like Leo Tolstoy said, 
everyone thinks of changing the world. No one thinks of changing himself. All right. It's one of my favorite quotes. It's like, I'm going to help everybody. It's like, help yourself, help yourself, help yourself, help yourself. Okay. Now when you know you are solid and you have really been helped, go share what you learned with others. And that's what you've done. And thank you for doing that and for doing the hard work of what you're doing of all the clinical trials and raising funds and doing that work and getting it out there. So thanks for doing that. And thank you for coming and sharing with us about it today. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Thank you for having me here and allowing me to share. Thanks. All right, guys. So it's intrinsicmedicine.com. If you want to learn more about HMOs and everything that they are doing over there. So we'll go ahead and close this up. Thank you so much. Thank you.